Welcome to our final lecture in the Food for Thought public lecture series from McDonald campus of McGill University. My name is Grant Clark. I'm an associate professor in bioresource engineering and one of the organizers of the Food for Thought series together with Anna Duff and Ingrid Charas who are here helping us this evening. I'm also a descendant of Northern European settlers and I live and work on unceded indigenous territory. The Ganyagahaga Nation are the custodians of Teotiage, the territory on which McGill University stands, and of the surrounding lakes and rivers. To the south of Montreal is the community of Kanawage, and to the west is the community of Kanasatage. I thank these people for having watched over these lands and waters for so long and for continuing to look after them today. A few housekeeping points. Please keep your audio muted during the lecture. Um, when the lecture is finished, there will be opportunity for questions and answers. I will monitor the chat window and relay any questions to the speaker if you want to post them in the chat. During the question and answer period, you can also unmute yourself if you like and ask your questions verbally. This evening, I'm very happy to uh, welcome Dr. Elsa Basseur. Elsa works on McDonald campus in the Faculty of Agriculture and Environmental Studies. She has her BSc in Agriculture, Food and Environmental Systems from Issa Lille in France, and her Master's in Rural Development and a Master's in Animal Behavior. She has her PhD from Université Laval in Animal Sciences. She's currently an Associate Professor of Animal Science at McGill. She holds the Enser Industrial Research Chair that is supported by Novale, the Dairy Farmers of Canada and Valacta on the sustainable life of dairy cattle, and she is a William Dawson scholar. Her research focuses on animal behavior, welfare, and sustainable livestock farming. There's a strong industry focus in her work, and she collaborates with farmers, processors, and other advisors in developing her research agenda. One example of her research is a project financed by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, to adapt the Senegalese livestock sector to climate change. And today, this evening, she's going to talk to us about what is coming for livestock farming. So Elsa, I invite you to share your screen and away we go. Okay, so you see my screen? We do. All right. Um, so thanks, thanks, uh, Professor Clark, for the introduction. Um, my very pleasure today to uh, to be to be able to talk about uh, uh, you know the research that uh, I'm connecting with my group and many many collaborators on on on, on livestock farming. Um, and today I will talk. Uh, you asked me to talk about us coming for livestock farming, and since it's uh, the end of the the first cycle of the research year, I feel like it was an excellent opportunity to talk about the lesson that we learned. Why is it not working? Here it works now. So, um, you know, we cannot really start a discussion on the future of livestock farming without maybe uh, getting some of those scenarios and trend for global food production here. It's a slide I took from Anne Mote. So Anne Mote, she's a, a senior livestock development advisor at the uh, UNFL. And, um, you know, they, they addressed, uh, you know, different type of scenario that could exist in the future in terms of what is the needs and what are we talking about in terms of needs for global food production. So here, uh, very simple, um, three type of scenario that's modeled by the FAO, the business as usual scenario, the toward, towards sustainability and the stratified society. So what does that mean? Uh, business as usual is exactly going and continue with the type of economic growth uh, that we have and same level of, uh, um, you know, food pr products in our diet. Uh, towards sustainability is a lower growth and a more plant diet uh, based. And the stratified society is basically, uh, you know, the two scenario where we continue to have unequal, uh, you know, needs and growth in between um, developing and uh, older societies. 
And I think in all of those scenarios, and you can find a, a lot of details in, uh, in, in the FAO 2018 publication is uh, basically, uh, you know, meat dairy eggs are still, uh, you know, uh, an important part of the diet and uh, it will only grow. Okay, there's no scenario where there's no uh, food productions and food products in the diet yet. So, uh, livestock is part of the diet. When we think about livestock, of course, uh, it's all a question of GPD. Um, so the ability of uh, you know economic growth uh, in a country, but it's not just that. And again, here uh, I took another slide from Anne, and you probably saw her presentations because she has uh, presented several times, uh, you know, in the last few years uh, since. Uh, the FAO was to, to brainstorm, but, uh, you know, uh, after their long shadow, uh, you know, uh, publications. So indeed, uh, livestock is not just a question of money. It's a question as well of being able to be used for manure, for example, for saving, for tractions. Uh, and that's really what we call in terms of true uh, livestock value. I think many of you, when you think about that, you think about probably that, uh, that picture. Uh, it's uh, so, uh, Clark, you, you explained that indeed uh, have an ongoing project with the Margaret at Gilliam Institute uh, in Senegal. And here is uh, our PhD students, uh, Kokiba, uh, you know, in discussions with the uh, small uh, pastors, uh, you know, pastoralists in Senegal. and. Uh, and indeed, um, you know, um, livestock, it's a question of small holders, but what really is, is a small holders? And, and today I really, uh, I really want to talk about the Canadian dairy farmers. I think uh, you guys have all seen the news of what's going on in, in BC and the floods in BC. And uh, uh, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a disaster for thousands of, uh, of families. But uh, it's also a place where uh, we have a lot of livestock, uh, a lot of uh, cattle, uh, a lot of chickens, and you know thousands and thousands of those animals um, that would be also uh, you know in concern. And and you know I must say that livestock producers are really tested for their re resilience in BC, uh, you know, in the, in the coming days and probably in the coming weeks. So when we think about livestock in Canada, um, it's 12,000 farms here, it's dairy, I should start right from start, so we will talk about dairy cattle. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of the main uh, contributor to um, the economy in terms of agriculture. But there's a ton of jobs that are also associated, uh, we know, with the, with, the, with the dairy production, which all the processing, advising, uh, all the stakeholders, many, and it's all everywhere in Canada. It's very present, uh, you know, in Quebec, uh, where, uh, you know, which is the, the, the province with most of those dairy farms. So dairy farmers of Canada are not just like um, need to produce milk. Today, there's a lot of concern to produce milk in the best of their ability to be able to meet, uh, you know, the uh, concerns and uh, somehow what expectation from the Canadian society. Uh, both in terms of providing quality in terms of products, but not just that. And for example, another slide that I took uh, from a presentation from last week, uh, Daniel Gobey, who is the, the, the president of the Les Producteurs de Lait du Québec, was explaining, for example, what is the process, progress that's been done in the, in the last uh, five years in terms of footprint. Okay, so here, for example, uh, there's a, and they, they, they do that, they do calculate, they monitor, and they try to really decrease as much as possible three of the main uh, footprint impacts that, um, you know, livestock production and dairy uh, are, are using. So the first one is the, is the, uh, well, is the carbon. Uh, the rest is, uh, for example, production of uh, the use of water and, um, you know, the use of land. So, with that in mind, um, Dairy Farmers of Canada uh, established here at McGill in 2016 and Dairy Farmers of Canada uh, Novale, which is uh, the consortium of the processors and uh, the dairy farmers in Quebec, 
and uh, Lactanet, which is the center of expertise for dairy, they established an industry researcher with the idea that um, the objective will be to understand better uh, how to improve and to get a more sustainable life for dairy cattle. And I will explain in, in, the, in the last uh, 30 minutes or so what we, what we meant by that and what were our objectives there. Um, when you think about dairy cattle, you know, they are very productive machine. They've been selected to actually produce milk to be efficient at that. And the lifestyle of dairy cow is programmed. Um, however, um, when, uh, you know, we established the chair at McGill in 2016, one of the points and one of the concerns is like dairy farmers already keep their cows for long. Right. So we know that uh, a cow takes three years before becoming a productive animals. And then, you know, you need another three years uh, to ensure that she kind of pay off the debt of the rearing cost. OK, so for the first two years, we're actually building to help, uh, you know, to get a return in investment. And, um, you know, the question was, do could animal comfort and eye longevity go hand to hand? Because, you know, in the last 30, 40 years, a lot of progress has been done on the genetic, on the nutrition, about how to manage the animal, how to care for the animal. But how come, you know, that the longevity uh, is not what, um, you know, I expected uh, by the farmer themselves? And um, that chair was uh, following 10 years of research finance in partnership with dairy producers. And I will present some of the results. And, uh, you know, I did my postdoc on, on that project, but there were so many uh, universities and, and collaborators involved. So basically, we visited a number of farms in Canada. That was the very first uh, big uh, epidemiological study done to try to understand comfort and welfare. And what we've done is we we survey everything that we put on the farm. We measure the true results of uh, the care that provided to the animal, which is the measure on the animals themselves. Uh, we take measure in the barns. Uh, we did survey with the farmers to understand the practices and we look at performance data. And uh, there's few systems, and I will go back in terms of housing systems in Canada, but whatever the system that was, you know, we knew that basically welfare status were not optimal everywhere and whatever the housing condition they had were affected care welfare. So um, here is some of those results. So you see, uh, you know, uh, some of the measure that we take, for example, is, is, is lameness. So the ability of the animal to walk properly. Lameness is, a, is an important concern, uh, you know, in the dairy industry. And we see that uh, for a number of those measures, whatever the system we have, so the robot, the freestall or the pistol systems, uh, we were not exactly meeting the targets and there was uh, quite a lot of progress to be done there. And when we look at some aspect of the housing, so here, for example, some aspect of the stall dimension, so that the beds where the cows are housed, we see that whatever the province is, we were usually under what is the recommendation. So here is the average in terms of centimeter between, for example, the bed length and what was found in, in the different systems in the different province. Um, and, you know, what happened is like uh, when you build a farm, it's for 30 years, 40 years, you hope for the, and the animal outgrow, of course, uh, you know, the housing systems. So it costs millions to build uh, a new building. So to be able to, uh, you know, use welfare as a means to, uh, you know, improve uh, the care, it was important to try to understand is basically, uh, does that pay to improve comfort, right? Um, so we did find here is one of the metrics, um, you know, that, that we found. And when we tried to look at comfort and longevity, we saw that indeed, uh, you know, the killing rate is, uh, there's a number of animals that leave the herd uh, each, each month, each year. Right? It's, a, it's a turnover. It's a natural turnover with the idea that the new generation will actually uh, be better than the next. And that's the way that, uh, you know, we continue um, the herd and the genetic uh, you know, uh, you know, and the production itself. So we see that, you know, when 
uh, lateness increase, we actually saw an increase in uh, curling rates. So some of those metrics give us ideas that basically, yes, comfort and longevity go together. And the other very important piece uh, that uh, need to be understood here in terms of context is uh, we knew uh, in 2016 that uh, the codes of practice of big practice in Canada and the production initiative is uh, basically the uh, program that audits, uh, you know, that uh, that code and the ability of farm to follow, uh, you know, their, their, their recommendations and the requirement need to be uh, reviewed because it's a process that's done every 10 years. So that's how, uh, you know, we established uh, the industry researcher. And I think that's important when I say we, uh, because um, that's a very interesting process where the needs is seen by, uh, you know, the industry and then they ask a researcher, so in that case me, to come with the program, but we agree on what are the priorities. Um, it's a five-year initiative uh, where the research is conducted in collaboration uh, with the industry partner. And while well, you guys should and you understand probably that there's no point of doing all of that research to try to improve uh, the system itself if somehow the uh, industry partners are not on board because uh, somehow uh, it's a really good design aspects and we all move uh, you know in the same duration and I will explain how we do that. So we started with a very, uh, very, very simple questions with the idea that in Quebec specifically, but in Canada, the main system is the Tyson system. And I will explain later what's the Tyson system, but basically the animals are restricted to um, a stall. And our question was very simplistic to say, can we actually improve the Tyson system? And um, when we think about um, what are the expectations from the citizens of the consumer, uh, freedom of movement is really high on the priority, okay? So that's picture of the first uh, outing of the year after the long winter, so the, the cows uh, were pretty excited to get outside. Uh, that's what we had in mind when we think about freedom of movement, and that's typically what uh, we have in mind when we think about good uh, housing, good condition, good system, uh, you know, for livestock. Uh, the reality is like in Canada and in many countries in the world, well, you know, it's not uh, the day-to-day -day life of the animals to be at pasture, uh, to do it in winter in, in Quebec, that would be pretty complicated anyway. But, you know, the type of system that exists in Canada is similar to many uh, countries for which we uh, produce milk intensively and uh, effectively. So a uh, Tyson system is the system that is predominant. And, um, uh, you know, there's a, a number of older systems, but basically when there's a stall, typically that's where we are right now in Canada. And there's a system where there's like no stalls and, you know, a free access, for example, to resources. But that system that are still marginal uh, in Canada and, and, and in the U.S. So uh, a welfare question becomes basically the Tyson is probably uh, the best model to be able to understand the need for movement. Because if uh, it's so important for the consumer to have that freedom of movement aspect, we wanted to understand basically, can we implement something in the housing conditions? Because removing the chain, uh, letting the animal lose, removing the stools, it, it, it's not happening overnight. And that doesn't happen very easily in a, in, a, in a housing system that are already built, okay? So the idea was to go step by step by trying to understand, can we increase those opportunities of movement um, and design some whole better uh, the stalls to be able to provide that? And that's an exercise that we've done for the first few trials, uh, you know, of, of the research. And I will give you an example. So that's the work that's been done by, uh, by Veronique where our idea was like, the animal is tied to a stall with a chain. It's, a, it's a roughly one meter. If we go beyond that and we give one meter and 40, 
will the cow will actually use that extra space? So does that even matter to try to do that? So what did we found? Uh, but we found that more we provide uh, lens in terms of chain, more the animal that is, and especially the intention of movement is shorter in cows with longer chain. So you need to think I'm usually focusing my first angle of approach to answer those questions are behavior. And I think that's the way to really be able to understand how the animal is, um, is acting, uh, you know, in our environment. Another important piece is like we found that basically they move more. So uh, you see on the picture, we track uh, the animal in our stall and, you know, it's not very useful for an animal to be in that type of position. But keep in mind that the idea was, does that actually matter? Will she use that dynamic space that's provided? And yes, we did. And we did find that she moved more. She used whatever space is there and uh, then she will access more the feed. So that's another interesting aspect. However, um, we always think about particularity. So yeah, we know that the cow is at least use one meter. We should not go below that, but uh, you know, providing more than that, even providing one meter, it doesn't work for every cow everywhere. And I think that's important to keep in mind that all of those recommendations are done with the idea that uh, we need to adjust for each farm, each condition and each animal. There's no story but one situation sweet all, especially when we talk about animals. So there's a number of scientific other results and other methods that we've developed. There's a ton of those that we developed, uh, you know, in those uh, those six years of the of the chair and one of it is really uh developing a bio tracking and to automatize uh you know the systems and you know it's done in in uh, in older uh you know fields so for example uh, we know that uh, it exists and there's apps um, that exist for insects for example uh, but as we talk about cows and as we talk about future to be able to really try to track on what's going on on commercial form, we, we're starting there, right? And we actually develop a system that with a very uh, small error, we're able to uh, actually uh, have a good placement of the cow in our environment. Another next steps important aspect is, well, you know, it will be just so easy not to be able to have to watch those animals because it takes times even doing and developing those automation systems, it takes time. So what about using a, a sample to detect cow welfare status? And that's uh, the PhD uh, that thesis that's done Mazen Bahadi in the, in the food science department here at McGill. And that's been quite a journey uh, to be able to uh, merge, uh, you know, the food science approach using the uh, FTRI, uh, you know, the spectrometry um, uh, type of analysis and, uh, you know, the, the animal science trials and um, uh, indicators that we use. So basically, uh, the, 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 the defi that uh, has Mason is like, well, we know now and we have a number of parameters so that we can improve, uh, you know, the stools, we can provide more opportunity of movement, but can we measure that? And, and really the first thing that's we've done is kind of develop a new techniques again. So we again talk about analytics uh, to be able to analyze those mix uh, FTR spectra, uh, you know, to be able to understand what's happening, uh, you know, uh, with our treatments. And uh, we really have a good proof of concepts. Um, we do find that actually FRTRI and behavior results are corroborating each other. And for some of them, they uh, corroborate well milk composition. So for example, uh, the cows that are longer chain show a lower level of biomarker associated with ruminal acidosis episodes. So it means that they were, uh, you know, probably um, ruminating better. Okay. So those few, uh, and I say few, but there's a number of those trials that we've done uh, as a proof of concept for how can we improve the Tysel system, lead the full community to have a shift basically in the research and say, well, there's so much that we can do at the stall. What can we do outside the stall? Can we actually move the cows out of the sub? And what's important is that will she benefit? 
So uh, we started our work on exercise and, and the first study was actually to say, can we actually move the cow in a pen, especially during the period that uh, she's dry off? And how does that compare with a sting in a stall? And we find interesting results. We find that basically there are greater variety of resting postures in pens. Uh, so, you know, things that we only see at pasture or on deep pack. And we also found that um, they improve their locomotor ability. I studied the tool by explaining that uh, lameness is fortunately a very important, um, you know, um, clinical sign and I will not say disease, but, you know, um, uh, in, in, in dairy industry. And what we found is just putting the cows out of stall for a period of time just improve their ability for the animal to walk. Again, um, that gives us establishing new references to increase the use of dry off loose pen. And that leads to a full new, uh, you know, research uh, fields for us in the lab uh, by better characterizing locomotion by using biomechanics of mobility. So really uh, what's coming and a lot of the work that I've been doing uh, recently, uh, you know, um, Amia and Anna just, uh, you know, submitted that the, and their thesis and defending their thesis is to again find ways to better understand locomotion and its attributes to somehow automatize against um, the scoring of lameness and try to develop early detection that we will use, uh, you know, in commercial form, and that is done with the use of kinetics and kinematics and of course uh, big analytics to help us to do that. So we really, uh, one of the key points of that research has been really to try to understand what exercise for dairy cows. And we started by looking at all of that literature and, and, and frankly uh, redefine the concepts because whatever we use quantitative or qualitative measure of what's was published in the literature, it's not really exercise, okay? Um, distance travel or, um, you know, providing a certain type of housing system, it's really a question of movement opportunity and that's really uh, a shift, uh, you know, in, uh, in the industry and in the science field to try to understand, you know, basically if we fix about locomotor activity, yes, between different housing systems from the tight the more restrictive to a pasture systems, we increase the number of steps. But um, exercise or providing more opportunity of movement, what are those benefits? And that's all the bulk of research that we are currently um, doing uh, here uh, on campus. Uh, so you can see a picture of the farm staff. Yeah, Pierre-Marc is a big uh, lead, uh, is our animal handler, uh, you know, uh, to be able to understand what is the activity? How do we maxim maximize the activity opportunity? What is the effect on the health of the animal, the human animal relationship? And look as well aspect like environmental management to be sure that we understand the full picture. So working together with the committee, we move from can we improve the toy system to let the cows out and how do we do that? Because actually, again, those buildings are not designed to let the cows out anymore. And uh, again, we need to be sure uh, that it's done properly because there will be a completely a negative feedback and for the animals and for the farmers. And uh, all of that research that we've been conducted, uh, you know, at McGill, is now integrated in the scientific lecture that's been done by the scientific committee that is the basis uh, for the decision for the new revision of the code of practice. And I invite you uh, to look at, uh, to start um, and to look at the, uh, that new document, that new version that started public consultations. We will open for public consultation. We'll have to address all of those comments and come even with a new version of that code. So the lot of work is done with the partner to be able to um, present all of those results and especially uh, do a lot of uh, knowledge transfer because at the end of the day, that research should not stay, uh, you know, at the university, but go exactly where uh, it should be, uh, you know, with the advisor, the vets and, uh, you know, of course, the farmers. So I will move to uh, the second aspect of the research because 
uh, welfare is fine it's important and the idea of having a better quality of life it's good but how to make sure cows age well was the other important component of the research and um the idea is how do we keep our cows longer and how can we welfare longevity and profitability intertwine basically so what we've done is uh, we revisited the concept of longevity so what does that mean uh on the basis of um historic data collected in quebec dairy herds okay and here I will present uh, the work from uh, one of the first PhD uh, study from, from uh, Gabriel Delago. And what we wanted to understand is we, we think, we say that uh, longevity is low, but what is really the status of uh, the Canadian dairy herd longevity and how does that compare in the rest of the world? And, and the first aspect that we had is really trying to understand what are those measures and how do we define? And that was very tricky because there's no metrics that are common in between countries. Uh, there's different ways of measuring longevity. And when we look at the measures and the metrics, that's the same. Uh, and unfortunately, most of the metrics are at the end of the life of the animal. Okay, so basically, we are the state point is, is she still in the herd or not? So how does that go with the production? So we all say that production increase. Uh, so it took uh, a quite a bit of time for Gabriel to find the right uh, metrics and specifically the right data to be able to compare those countries. Uh, what we found is yes, mean increase over time in all of those 10 countries that are from the top 10 uh, milk producing countries in the world and there's uh, variability between countries and 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 we know that it, it's 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 linked to a number of improvement for example in nutrition health uh, in our ability to to, to control the environmental factor etc when you start to look at longevity well that's where we're getting serious and that was very surprising is we had three type of scenarios the scenario that we uh where we know or we felt was uh, the canadian one was really that there's a decrease in, in longevity and it's true that's what we find in canada and in six of those 10 countries there's one country for which the longevity so the ability for the farmer to keep the animal for longer increase and that was the new zealand system and there were three countries for which actually didn't change. And when we look at the US over the last decades, well, you know, it was low and it stayed low. And that's, um, you know, that's not uh, what usually we had in mind. So that was quite a bit of important finding with the idea that um, there's a completely lack in uniformity, uniformity in reporting. So that makes comparison very difficult. Most of the metrics are not on the early life when if the idea is to keep the animal for longer, we should be able to target early on the best candidate for that to help uh, you know, to reduce those costs um, and to increase the quality of life of the animals. And what we found is longevity and milk production don't exactly go hand to hand, but not always. And we know that similar production systems um, are identical for when longevity decreases. But there's no, we don't have the data to make the exact link. Uh, this faster improved longevity, you know what? We don't have the data to be able to do that. We know that uh, the New Zealand system, which is pasture based, uh, shows an increase in longevity but it's not the only thing that's happening and that can define that system so we cannot just do pasture equal higher longevity definitely not we we, we don't have the data to be able to do that and what's uh, what came from gabriel's study was to say well we need to define early indicator to be able to target early on the animal that will reach their food potential and the potential is not in terms of productivity it's really a question of profitability and to be able to understand which are the best candidates, um, you know, to keep the animal for longer and comfortable. And that's the second study, uh, or second piece of results that I will present, and that's the work that's been done by Maria on what we call the true uh, cost of disease of the hidden cost of disease. Um, animal have to live 
uh, farmers to the um, need to let the animal leave for tourism, either it's voluntary, but most of the cases is what we call involuntary culling. So it's really for reason mainly due to disease or reproductive problems. Um, so when we look at the true, the cost of uh, an incidence of a health incidence, Typically, um, what is reported is how much does it cost to uh, discard the milk or how much does that cost to, um, to treat the animal. And what we look with Maria, we really try to understand the aspects in terms of true profit. Okay. And what we did is we compared for the first lactation of animals. Uh, healthy cows to cows that, for example, have a first instance of disease, in that case is lameness. And how does that compare when we look at what's happening over the lactation? And what we found is whatever we look at cumulative milk yield, uh, margin over fiscals, or even gross profits, uh, animals with uh, unhealth events uh, basically will never reach uh, the level of an animal that never gets one of those episodes. Okay, and we know, for example, that. Um, you know, specifically when lameness appear during the first period of the lactation, uh, the animal will never be able to make money by comparison to how they know. The other thing that we show with our Quebec data, uh, over 5,000 herds, is like, um, you know, those incidents of disease will lead to an increase in killing rate. Um, and that's something that was not presented before as well, up to two times. So basically, um, if the animal is sick, she will not reach, uh, you know, the next lactation. And all goals, I think you understand where I'm coming with the welfare aspect is like our ability to keep the animal healthy uh, is really a true way to be able to keep the animal for longer in the herd. And that's what we found. We really found that uh, disease uh, like mastitis and lameness decreased profit and production. And for a lot, you know, one thousand uh, dollar uh, per sick cow, it, it's a lot. It's a lot uh, when you think about uh, a herd of sixty or uh, one hundred cows, and that increased the killing risk. The other thing that we uh, we did found is like the decision to kill an animal so to, or to keep an animal in the herd is not based on production. Or profit, okay, um, and that's where we're coming. After that, is like what we found is like um, there's no tools today that help to really see uh, on uh, on um, on real time the real value of profit and losses to help producers to better select the candidate to keep uh, in the herd for greater profitability. And that's some of the work as well. And that's the the last piece of of first what I would show today is a work in terms of tools development to help to select candidates to keep run on the lactation. Because I don't think it's good enough to present results and to show the obvious. I think that's important that we try to develop tools to help, uh, you know, uh, change uh, the decision process. So keep the most profitable cows, uh, you know, we starting by doing focus groups with producers, advisors and vets on the killing reasons. And we confirm that basically the decision to decide to keep a cow today in the herd is usually based in what's happening in that month, maybe in that lactation, but that's it, right? And usually producers often underestimate the cumulative costs. So when we look, and that's, that's a work uh, I've been doing with some of my colleagues here, and uh, I really uh, I want to acknowledge here uh, Professor Roger Q, because that's a, a work that is starting with his PhD student, uh, Hector Delgado, but um, we calculate the cost and the profits. And when we do the lifetime cumulative values, what we found is when we consider both cumulative cost and profits, uh, we could identify cows that are more profitable, okay? And there's a, there's a need uh, to be able to do that if we don't want to rely on uh, maybe an, an indicated guess, okay? And uh, what we've done is uh, we've developed, um, you know, a prototype of tool uh, to be able to show cost and profits and see how it works. So there's fine tunings to be done there. 
but at least uh, you know that's something um, that will continue to work in the future. So what we know is like cows that contributed most to the herd profitability can be identified. And we know as well that cows with high initial costs, they will never be profitable. And that's something as well that is not usually uh, presented. It's like the cow that we like, but is always sick or is really high maintenance and rely on high inputs. That's not the animal that actually need to stay in the herd if we think about profitability and quality of life. And we always need to consider community cost and revenue in decision-making process, like in every uh, you know, type of, of company. So um, the development of um, those tools, um, you know, to keep the most profitable cows, uh, there's a lot of work and that's another field uh, of research to be able to develop a decision support tool with usual, a useful benchmark to help, uh, you know, to the decision process. Um, there's plenty of people that's been uh, involved in that research. Here, I wanted to show a picture of my current team completely in hybrid. Uh, so uh, we start to have people back in, in the lab and uh, co collecting new data. And I wanted to, to finish on, on what's next um, because the chair uh, stop uh, in its current status at the end of this year. Uh, we, we're already working what's coming next. Um, we've been working on that for over a year. Um, the idea will be really to continue work on welfare and longevity together, but bringing new uh, type of endears, so working on the emotion, the mobility and the biomarker and really um, relying on remote sensing and IA for um, developing, uh, you know, um, a new tools. And that's a work that I will call it uh, with a colleague, uh, Professor Diallo, uh, from UK in computer science. And um, we already secured, um, you know, the uh, industry support and uh, we will um, submit uh, our proposal in the coming weeks. Uh, you know, as a, as a Christmas gift. So um, I thank you uh, for that. And uh, I have time for your question. And here it's a picture of um, last week, actually, uh, you know, of the new uh, experiment that we're conducting on the barn, uh, you know, on exercise access. And I think I've been on my time. There we go. Thank you very much, Elsa. That was a nice talk. So I would like to open the question, open the questions, open the floor to questions from the viewers now. You can feel free to type your questions into the chat if you like, or you can unmute yourself, turn on your microphone and, and ask them verbally. I have a question for you, Elsa. Go ahead. This might not be directly related to your research, but um, what do you think about the future of product diversity and herd diversity in the dairy industry? I've always wondered, you know, about the trend toward Holstein cows, right? Is there room for other kinds of cows and different varieties of products based on different kinds of milk? Well, you know that the Canadian love their Austin cows, right? And they work really, really hard to have a, a, a genetic that actually is exported, uh, you know, in the rest of the world. But actually, there's other breeds uh, in Canada, and there's already some cheese that are made on those breeds. Um, <laughs> what's the future? Well, you know, that's something that we should ask uh, dairy farmers. What I can say is like, you know, in Canada, the farmers are selling their milk uh, together and they work together uh, as well at um, processing, uh, you know, um, their, um, their product. Um, there's been, uh, since I moved in Canada, quite a development in terms of cheese and type of cheese. And I think uh, the type of yogurts and dairy products are completely different uh, from like 15 years ago, that's for sure. Uh, so we cannot say that uh, the industry didn't work at trying to um, 
uh, you know, diversify their products. So I think it's really there. Uh, there's few cheeses that are really based on some specific breeds, and I, I think that's probably something that 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 will continue. And and uh, uh, you know, when we think about um, um, welfare and and an alternative for building a new barn, you know, some some farmers feel like actually, uh, you know. Um, Selecting differently, uh, you know, even have different breeds could be uh, could be a solution as well. So yes, uh, there will be, but uh, I don't think the old team cannon and cows will disappear uh, so soon because people have worked really hard, uh, you know, to uh, to make it better. And you know, it is uh, it's farmers that develop uh, the breeds, so it's really uh, you know a community building around that that breed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, we have a question from Marilyn Scott in the chat. She says, you mentioned the emotional component. I wondered if you have considered whether there's a neighbor dimension when there is a sick or lame cow in the next stall. <laughs> Thanks, Marilyn, for that. Um, so the emotions side that we started to work on uh, in, the, in the lab came when we started to get the cows out. And what we wanted to understand is the, uh, basically the benefit for the cows, but how the cows is perceiving, uh, you know, that new experience. So um, we have quite interesting type of results. What we found is the way that we handle the animal will have a very uh, big impact on how the animal is reacting to that overall experience. Okay, so we know that uh, we've testing quite a few uh, ways of handling those cows to uh, to put them outside to limit injuries and to favor human animal relationships and reactivities. And I think we're we have a good system now. Um, so you know we're there. Uh, interestingly, uh, Marlene, what's coming uh, with the renewal of the chair is we will work on uh, understanding better how to enrich um, the life of the animals at the stall and outside, and the neighbors and the social enrichment will be considered. And that's something that we really uh, will work on is trying to understand, uh, indeed, uh, you know, are some cows better suited together and how does that impact uh, not just, um, you know, the emotion aspect, but indeed the health aspects. We know already and that some cows are buddies and some cows are not. We know as well that uh, some cows are more dominant than the other, but depending on the situation, it's not the same cow. So it's not an easy question. The cows that is dominant outside may not be the same cows that will be uh, maybe more reactive during milking. So it's not an easy question, but that's definitely something that we will look, uh, you know, in the coming years. Thank you. Um, I'll pose another question of my own. We had a fellow come in and talk to our engineering class about the sort of agricultural contract work he does in construction. And he says the vast majority of the new barns that are being built in Quebec and Eastern Ontario now are based on robotic milkers. And I wonder if you can comment on what you see as the potential impact of robotic technology, robotic milking technology on cow, cattle welfare, cow welfare. So um, indeed, uh, you, robot milking system, it's, it's a technology, but it's not a new technology. And that's something that's been developed in the 90s, uh, you know, in, um, in Europe, specifically in Netherlands and in Sweden. And the few, uh, there's some robots that arrived in Canada in the 2000s, right? Um, so definitely new constrictions in Quebec uh, are moving to Freestall. And usually when there's freestall, robots are in the picture. I'm not saying always, but uh, you know, because of the uh, limits in terms of labor, uh, you know, the robot system is a, is a very good one. Not that you need less people, but there's more flexibility in it. Okay, so that's why uh, there's uh, quite a bit of work that we've done on the acceptability of, of that. The problem that we have uh, with the robots is it comes with the old system. So basically, we're not selling just the robot. Usually, you sell the robot, but how we design the, the barn, because we cannot just say, okay, at Mac Campus, 
let's redesign the toy stall that we have and put a robot, it will not work. So uh, a lot of the inside of the barn is based on the robots. And um, for quite a bit of time, there were a few designs that were always kind of sold together. Now there's a bit more, uh, you know, of course, they've done more research. So for example, there's robots and pasture systems. Uh, there's robots and uh, composted deep bed pack that were systems that were not existing at the beginning because what we had at the beginning is systems that were existing and predominant, for example, in the Netherlands, which were stalls, uh, you know, little bedding and, um, you know, robot milking system. So uh, as, uh, you know, um, there's, a, there's, a, there, there's more variety here, but the, the robot's still quite uh, similar in terms of the way it works, where we need to find ways and design the environment so the cows will go uh, to the milking system. But how do we do that, but at the same time give the opportunity to put the animal outside? So basically, if you're an organic farmer and you need to pasture your cows in the summer, uh, you know, you will not buy one robot for the outside and one robot for the inside. You only have your robot from the inside. So how do you organize the systems to be able to manage that? So, uh, you know, there's, there, there's uh, of course, uh, the engineers have been innovative here to try to find system, but indeed, uh, you know, um, uh, there's uh, there's the engineer, there's the constructor, and there's the the need of the farmer and the specific management that the farmer want to have uh, for his farm, and that's that's not always a, a, an easy uh, <laughs> an easy uh, an easy way to implement. All right, thank you. So we'll go back to the chat, and we have another question from Marilyn. She says, given that it takes four lactations before a cow becomes profitable, it would seem that there's a big cost in culling a cow that is no longer above the profitability threshold, but is still producing milk, as it will take a long time before the replacement cow will become profitable. No, indeed. It's a very, um, it's a very complex um, uh, concept, okay? Um, first of all, uh, you know, it could be profitable earlier than in the third lactation. Some of cows are return of profit is quick, but the reality is like for quite a long time, you know, um, the metrics that were used by dairy farmer is how much the cows is producing in terms of milk and actually not a kilo of milk but they were focusing on protein fat because that's how you know the quota system so how they're paid is made on uh, the reality is like more and more the research that we show shows that um you know the resilient cow the cows that produce a bit less but is never sick is actually much more profitable on the long term Okay, but you need to be able to keep that animal in good health to be able to benefit from that. So it's a, it's quite um, uh, it's quite a complex system, and uh, instead, uh, you know, there's all that concepts as well that the next generation of cow will be more efficient because that's what the genetic is. It's like you feel like each generation is uh, somehow uh, has a chance to be a better cow than the previous one because uh, you're selecting on specific traits. Uh, so there's always like uh, the needs and the idea that we need to replace cows. So the trade-off between how many cows do we need to replace, which cow are the best candidate to stay, and, you know, not all cows need to stay for 10 lactations. That's not the way it is. But there are some cows that could stay for very long. There are some cows that may not actually uh, be bred and should probably be removed from the, from the herd way early. Uh, and there are some of those cows that we need to follow and to keep as much as we can in the herd. So it's a very complicated trade-off. And indeed, uh, Marlene, we're not talking about cows that are so sick that they're not producing. But, you know, Terry cows are so robust that they will produce milk. That's what they do. They will uh, lose weight before they stop to produce milk. And, uh, you know, that's, that's why, you know, it's, it's tricky as well. So we know that, of course, when they're very sick, uh, they, you know, they, the, the milk decrease, but they will continue to produce milk. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I will keep the Zoom session open for a few more minutes. 
in case anybody wants to stay on and ask more questions. But because we're at the bottom of the hour, I'm going to end the recording now. Before I do, I just want to thank all of you for attending and thank Dr. Vasseur very much for her time and for sharing her expertise and her stories with us and telling us about her research. Thank you very much, Elsa. Thank you so much, Grant. It was a pleasure. And to everybody, I wish you a good evening and a warm winter. And I hope to see you all back for our series when it begins next fall in 2022. So stay well, stay safe.